Uh, I, I, I'm going to take just a few minutes for what I call commentary, and then I'll get into the final message on ownership. Um, you all know that we've been hearing about shortages, gasoline, baby formula, groceries. And I happen to, you know, flash back to when we started in the ministry. We never experienced any shortages. We had the potential to experience them. For example, we were traveling full time at that time in the early 70s when they had a gas shortage. And it turned out to be much like the things we experience today. It was contrived. It was manipulated. It was controlled. And, uh, but we never waited in a line. I remember we were in church in uh, Texas, and uh, <clears throat> we had just finished preaching. And I share these stories to encourage you. And uh, we asked the congregation to agree with us uh, that we'd have gas to go to the next town because in those days we just, it was a Sunday night, everything's closed, all the gas stations closed, and we were going to drive on to the next town for the next meeting. And I just asked them to agree with us. They did. So we got out, we were loading the van, getting ready to go to the next town. And this lady walked up to us. Now, I don't know how many of y'all ever saw Ma and Paul Kettle on the farm. <laughs> she looked like Ma Kettle. And it was, of course, played by Marjorie Maine. And she had on bib overalls, hair up in a bun. She walked up to me at the van. She said, Sonny boy, you need some gasoline? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, follow me. She got in her truck, and we followed her to her farm. And she had a gas pump. It's what she used for her farm equipment. And she filled our little van up and waved bye-bye. When we were getting ready to buy groceries one Wednesday and had no money, I heard a knock on the door. There was a lady standing there, and she had a $50 bill. She said, my husband was a traveling salesman, and he said the Lord spoke to him, and he stopped on the side of the road to use a pay phone. You remember what pay phones are. And said, the Caldwells need $50. Take it to them today. So she handed me $50. We had money to buy groceries. And, of course, those days you could buy $50. You could buy five, six, seven sacks of groceries for $50. Well, I was thrilled because God knew where we lived. Amen. And he took care of us. We didn't have any money to buy clothes. Jeannie went in her closet, started giving her clothes away. And she got asked to speak to a ladies' convention. And the lady happened to uh, own a dress shop. She took her down to her dress shop said, Did you see anything you like? Oh, yeah, but she said, I don't have any money. She said, I want you to take some of these dresses, pick out what you want. She brought a whole trunk load full of them home, put them on the bed. Amen. And she had asked God for clothes with tags on them. Yeah. And there they were. And Ronnie and I walked in and we said, where's ours? <laughs> and she said, use your own faith. <laughs> so we have faced these shortages. You know, back in the early 70s when we started and people were talking about, well, milk's going to go to a dollar a gallon Bread to two dollars a loaf. Well, you know, if you have the dollar a gallon, if you have the dollar for the loaf of bread, yeah. you're not going to experience any loss or any lack. Right. And uh, I want you to turn with me over to Matthew six, and let's read Matthew six, beginning with verse twenty-five. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink. Uh, yet for your body, what you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Then he talks about the fowls of the air. They don't sow, don't reap, uh, gather into barns, but he your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought or worry, anxiety, uh, can add one cubit to your stature? And why take ye thought or worry or anxiety for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, no anxious thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What, wherewith shall we be clothed? 
For after all these things the Gentiles seek, your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these what? Things, things will be added. So there's no reason for us to fear uh, shortages. And you can use your faith, and God will supply. I remember the widow woman that had uh, uh, was going to eat the last cake she had and die, and a prophet came and said, you know, give me a cake first, and, and uh, then go get all the vessels you can. And the oil flowed until all the vessels were filled. Now, now watch this. When there were no more vessels, the oil stopped. God's extravagant, but He's not wasteful. So when there was no more vessel to catch the oil, only then did the oil stop. But I say these things to you to encourage you because out there in the world and on the news, you'll hear all kinds of things that, uh, are designed to cause you to, to fear uh, and to be afraid. The Lord reminded me in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 13, I won't read it, but He said, All these things are common to man. All these things that we face are common to mankind, to humanity. Uh, I want to deal with uh, one more thing. I just happened to click onto this. Uh, this afternoon. I don't remember what I was looking for, but I printed it out. Have you ever heard about the upcoming global reset? Now, there are different versions of this, and I, I hear my preacher friends talking about the apocalyptic reset. Uh, I hear others talking about the global reset or just reset. And <clears throat> Everybody has a different opinion, and most of the things that they opinionize are supposedly based on Scripture, but the global reset that the world is talking about is the transformation from capitalism to socialism. Global reset. We're going to change the way we do business. We're going to change our economic structure. We're going to go from capitalism to socialism, to communism. But that's not what the Bible's talking about. Then you see when you get on a certain airline, you'll see above the door it has a new world order or one world order. And uh, they're all looking for a total trans uh, transition in the, in the culture. <clears throat> well, I, I happened to see this. It popped up. It said, uh, you remember the doomsday clock? Yeah. I remember that when I was in yeah. school. And uh, this doomsday clock, doomsday clock depicts how close humanity is to Armageddon. And, of course, uh, most all the people that are looking at Global Reset, they're thinking about the end of the world. Uh, uh, they're thinking about uh, economics. But the Bible is very clear, That's right. and I'll tell you what it is. The doomsday clock depicts how close humanity is to Armageddon. But where did it come from? And how do you read the doomsday clock? I don't know if you remember, but I do in school sometimes. Uh, they would just have a clock, uh, and they would respond to, uh, we're coming to the end of time, and the teacher would move the hand over, five minutes till 12, three minutes till 12. Do you know they've been moving that clock around for um, hundreds of years? <laughs> In 1939, now I'm going to tell you something you may not know. Um, Albert Einstein wrote a letter to the president, who at that time was Franklin Roosevelt. And he presented to him a breakthrough in nuclear technology that was so powerful, it could have a tremendous battlefield consequence. A single nuclear bomb carried by boat, could explode in a port and very well destroy the whole area around it. This letter came to establish what was known as the Manhattan Project. Now, if you remember your history, that was the, at, at a bomb, the atomic bomb that we dropped uh, over in Japan uh, that ended uh, World War II. 
Now, I was listening to an interview uh, with Elon Musk. Anybody drive a Tesla car? Uh, you know, if you live long enough, you may. But it, he's a, a genius in so many ways. And he was uh, developing the electric car, the Tesla, and then SpaceX is his corporation. And they make rockets and send them to outer space and satellite technology and so forth. And I was interested in this uh, interview with him because he said there is coming a threat to humankind that is much more dangerous than the nuclear warhead. You want to know what it is? Artificial intelligence. AI. You ever heard of that? AI? Jesse and Kathy DePlantis have one of these cones in their kitchen, in their home. Artificial intelligence. Um, it's much more intellectual than just Siri on your phone. Did you know, according to the definition of cyborg, you're a cyborg? Cyborg is part human and part electronics. If you have one of these, you're a cyborg. You're bionic because you have at your fingertips information that you will never, ever know or learn uh, except for what's been put on that phone. You may have put it there, somebody else put it there. How many, you know, when you, you it tapped into this thing sometimes, stuff pops up that you don't even know where it came from. And Elon Musk said, I've tried to warn you for years, but he said, <clears throat> I'm hearing nothing from people that I try to warn. So he said, it's probably too late now to stop the development of artificial intelligence. AI, and anyway, this cone that Jesse and Kathy have on their kitchen, Jesse was having fun, and he was real proud of it, so he said, whatever, he, whatever they call it, he said, uh, tell me who Jesse Duplantis is, and the voice says, oh, Jesse Duplantis is a great evangelist and preaches all over the world. He said, thank you very much. He said, tell me who Kathy Duplantis is, and the voice said, we don't know who that is. <laughs> And, of course, he just laughed. He thought that was funny. Elon Musk says the reason that <laughs> this AI, artificial intelligence, is so dangerous, more so than nuclear uh, warheads, is because it is fastly becoming where no one can control artificial intelligence. And they're building robots that are smarter than the people that built them. And he said the danger is because, and listen to this, let's tell you something about him. Pray for him because he could get saved any minute now. But he said the problem is, is if you have artificial intelligence and the cyborgs and the robots become smarter than the people that cre created them or made them, there is no moral component to stop these cyborgs from doing whatever they won't. Yeah. He said, you've got to have moral fiber, moral intelligence, uh, if you're going to use that kind of intelligence level. Somebody has to control or decide whether it's used for good or bad. Yeah. And I thought this was absolutely astounding. And then uh, getting back to this uh, doomsday clock, because I recognize this. They have a graph here where you can look at the doomsday clock, and it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. In fact, it, right, in, well, in 2020, uh, they backed it up to uh, 20 minutes and 30 seconds. So it, it went from, when I was in school, it went from five minutes to midnight to, oh, we've got 20 more minutes before the world ends. But I've got news for you. The earth is going nowhere. Uh, you might read in, in Revelation where it says in the heavens and earth will pass away, but that word pass away does not mean cease to exist. The Bible says the world will be, the earth will be renovated by fire. And none of that happens until after the millennial reign, the, the thousand year reign of Christ. And then comes Armageddon. And then comes the uh, renovation of the earth, renovated by fire. But it doesn't go away. 
It just changes form. Uh, listen to this. I was particularly interested in this because I was there. Um, the movement of the doomsday clock is not to tell us how big the risk facing humanity is, but how well we are doing in responding to that risk. For instance, 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis is generally agreed to have been the closest the world ever came to nuclear war. I was there. I was on a destroyer, a tin can as we used to call it. They call it a tin can because it had less armor than the battleships and aircraft carriers because we needed to move fast. I was there. I was on board my ship in my gun mount just waiting for Castro and Khrushchev to break that barrier. And we were going to unload everything we had. The Marines were dug in, and we were in our gun mounts eight hours on, eight hours off. I had no idea that that was the closest we had ever come to a nuclear war. Of course, you know, we're <laughs> the whole crew was 19, 20 years old and stupid and not afraid, <laughs> not, not afraid of anything. You know, we didn't, we didn't realize what was going on. But these people said this was the closest that it ever came uh, to reaching doomsday. On the other hand, in 1963, <laughs> partial nuclear test ban treaty came and it saw the clock's hands shifted back from midnight an entire five minutes. <laughs> Who would imagine in history I was a part yeah. of moving the doomsday clock back five minutes. Oh, man. Uh, well, let me move on. I've uh, probably spent enough time with all that. Uh, the global reset, if you go to Matthew 24, the global, the global reset, according to the Bible, is after the tribulation is over. Of course, there'll be a global reset when the tribulation starts. When the Antichrist, the false prophet, the beast system all go into effect, then the global reset will take place. There'll be a seven-year treaty with, with Israel. Uh, the Antichrist will make it. First three and a half years will be peaceful. But then in the mid, middle of the seven years, he breaks the treaty. And that's when the great tribulation, that's when the bad part of the tribulation uh, begins. That will definitely be a global reset. Now, Terry James, uh, I don't know if you know who Terry is. You can see him on VTN. He's on Skywatch. He's on one of our programs there. Terry, I've had him on my program, writes a lot of books about prophecy. He lives in Benton. And the latest book that he wrote was called The Disappearing. And it says, The Event That Will Shock the World. And he's talking about the rapture. When the rapture takes place, he says, and I hadn't gotten to read it yet because my wife's got it and she's still reading it. But he says when the rapture takes place, there are going to be mothers that are going to go in to check their babies in the morning and they're going to be gone. And the mothers are going to run to the phone and call the police. They're going to go next door. They're going to try to find out where their child is, go to pick them up at school, and they're gone. Think about it. <laughs> it's a reality. And mothers are going to be terrified because they're going to think somebody stole their baby, stole their kids. But nobody stole them. They just went up to meet Jesus in the air. That's going to be a global reset. All the people that go in the rapture, there won't be anybody here to work. Of course, we almost got that problem now. <laughs> there won't be anybody here to pay taxes. Millions of people will be gone. <laughs> uh, my insurance agent, he every year sends me my homeowner's insurance <coughs> policy to renew and all that. It's an it's a umbrella as it covers the automobile and everything. And every year it just keeps going up and up and up and up. And I told him, I said, look, 
uh, this is not sustainable. I said, I'm not going to do this. Every year I have to call you and try to get you to, you know, shave something here, shave something there. He said, well, I noticed you have $1,000 of premium just for earthquake insurance. I said, well, cut that. He said, oh, oh, oh you don't want to cut the earthquake insurance, do you? I said, yeah, I don't need earthquake insurance. He, he said, well, what would you do if you had an earthquake and destroyed your house? I said, I'd just hire a bulldozer and push it over the cliff and sell the lot. <laughs> you know, at this stage of my life, I'm not interested in rebuilding a, a house and all that kind of stuff. And so it just kept going up and up and up. And I told him, I said, you're going to have to start cutting this back because I'm not going to keep paying these, these, these prices. Well, he did. He found a, a cheaper rate, cheaper company, and cost less money and reduced it several thousand dollars. Well, as you continue to grow in, in uh, time and effort and labor and, and what you're doing, you've got to be more frugal. You've got to be more uh, direct, uh, more precise in what you're doing. You can't just sloppily roll along life's happy little way because you're going to be held responsible Amen. for what you're doing right. with what you have. Now, let's go to... Um, uh, uh, let's see. Let's go over to Luke 15. And I, I want to uh, conclude our teaching on ownership. <clears throat> I think I've done, this will be my third, third and final lesson. Um, I, I, I want to talk about tonight, I want to talk about, <coughs> excuse me, developing an ownership mentality. Because it's hard if you've always thought all your life you don't own nothing, God owns it all, you're just a steward, uh, you're just a servant, and you're just, you know, uh, taking care of the dishes and all that, you're not worth much. But you are. You are an owner. You're a joint heir with Christ. And God has put you and given you dominion over His creation. But you have to develop an ownership mentality. It won't just come to you by osmosis. I had a roommate in college. Uh, where, where is, where is Kathy? Oh, Kathy, uh, Kathy and I went to uh, Henderson State Church. Her husband and I were in ROTC together, and and we went to Henderson State Teachers College, Henderson University now, uh, along with Gloria Copeland. Gloria was uh, in the same year in the same school. Anyway. Um, I had, a, I had a roommate, and uh, he slept through all of his classes. His name was Jimmy Crane. They called him Ox. But he was smart. He became a computer programmer. But he would sleep through all his classes, and, and he would sleep on his textbook. And, of course, in those days in the dormitory, he, he had a bed over here and a bed over here and a desk in the middle. And So I'd say, Jimmy, what are you doing, man? You're sleeping your life away. You're... You, you, what are you doing? You sleep on your textbook? He said, yes, I am absorbing knowledge. <laughs> well, you don't absorb knowledge <laughs> like osmosis. <laughs> Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Okay, look at Luke 15. This is about what we call the prodigal son. Verse 11, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto them his living. So this son asked for his inheritance, right? Mm -hmm. And when he had spent all his inheritance, there arose a mighty famine in the land. He began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now that, that's, that's a no-no for a young Jewish boy. He would have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, but no man gave unto him. So when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. Now read very carefully. Notice, this young man is a son. He asked his father for his inheritance. He gave it to him. This boy is not a servant. He's not a slave. He is a son. Say, so he's a son. He's a son. He is an heir. Mm -hmm. 
He is owner of everything that his father created and has willed to him. And he said, my father's servants are doing better than me. Notice the difference. He understood the difference between being a son and being a servant. So he said, I will arise, verse 18, and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. He couldn't. He couldn't do that. And if you notice, the father didn't answer him either. Why couldn't he make him a servant? Because he was born a son. He was not a servant. I've shared this with you before. My dad uh, called my sister and I together uh, before he died and said, here's my will, here's my trust fund, here's what I'm going to do. When I die, you get a cash disbursement from the trust fund, and then uh, at, you, you hold on to it. You can pass it on to your kids and their kids. And he was smart and planned this out with a Jewish friend of his. And uh, after he died, there was a cash disbursement, and then, uh, you know, I started getting these quarterly reports from his trust fund. And one day I just started thinking, Lord, this is so wonderful. I mean, it wasn't a whole lot of money, but I said, I appreciate this. And I'm so blessed, so thankful. I've, I, I'm so appreciative of my dad thinking this way. He even included in his will his children and his children's children. Hallelujah. And he added in there even any adopted children. So he covered everything. Adopted means literally placed, legally placed as a son. So he covered all the bases. And I said, Lord, look at this. I didn't do one thing to earn any of this. I didn't do one thing to deserve this. I said, the only thing that qualified me for this inheritance was I was born my father's son. He said, yeah, and that's what qualifies you for my inheritance is to be born again. You're born. Hallelujah. You're a member of the family now. And so this young man, he just simply asked for his inheritance. I remember my grandfather, Caldwell, my father's father. Now, he was born in 1889. He worked hard all his life. And uh, when he retired, he just kind of sat down. But he'd been very frugal. He was a, a carpenter. He built his own home, built his furniture. Uh, and uh, he lived off of his uh, pension and retirement, wherever he worked for the U.S. Post Office and then for the railroad. And uh, he didn't have a whole lot. He and grandmother just lived in a little two-bedroom house, a one-bathroom, and but they were perfectly happy. But they put four kids through college, and they were Baptists, so they tithed. <laughs> they made it through the Great Depression, never lacked for a thing. Amen. My grandfather told me he said, "Grandson, you can drive down. You could drive down uh, Capitol Avenue." during the Depression, and you would see men standing on the street corner for blocks waiting to get a piece of bread or a bowl of soup. He never lacked for anything. I believe it was because they were tithers and, uh, and they, they served God. But uh, he told me that uh, he was going to give his kids their inheritance before he died, which he did. He wrote them all out of check. He gave me... He didn't give me any money, but he gave me all of his woodworking tools. I mean, these things are antiques. And Andrew Womack is a big uh, woodworker guy. He loves to do that. So I sent him, uh, he has a workshop. I sent him my grandfather's auger. It's a big, huge thing, and he, he twisted like that. I sent it to him, and he wanted to know the history of it because he put it up on his uh, workshop wall and had a little plaque saying this came from H.P. Caldwell, 1889 to 1978, Happy Caldwell's grandfather. Yeah. And the, these are, uh, I, I think they're memorable yeah. days and in inheritance. And uh, my grandfather, uh, he, he trusted God and he gave all of his kids their inheritance before he died. Lester Summerall did the same thing. He had three sons. He called them all in and said, here's yours and here's yours and here's yours. And when I die, there ain't nothing. You got it now. Amen. I like that. 
I, you don't want to make your kids wait till you die before <laughs> they get anything. Give it to them while you can. And, and then tell them, okay, I'm going to give you your inheritance now, but that means you take care of me until I die. <laughs> I remember, uh, I think it was Jerry Seville told about the fact that his daddy, he and his daddy were big buddies. They were racers, car racers, body men, body, body shop. And it said uh, the rule was if Jerry misbehaved or cut up with his car or something, his daddy would take his keys away from him. So when his daddy died, <laughs> he walked by the casket and he took the keys and he dropped them in the casket <laughs> with his dad. And then he, he tells a story of how uh, one day his dad took the keys away from him and was real, real hard on him. And he said, okay, dad. You got to remember, when you get old, I'm the one that decides whether you go to a nursing home or not. <laughs> kind of held it over his head. But we have a responsibility to develop an ownership Amen. mentality. Uh, let, let me keep on reading here. He could not make the son a servant because he was a son. And he arose and he came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion on him, fell on his neck, kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven in your sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, no, the father totally ignored all of that. Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, bring the fatted calf, kill it, let's eat and be merry, have a party. This is my son. Say it out loud. This is my son. He was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. They began to have a party. Be merry. Now the elder son, he's still a son too. The elder son came and he drew near to the house and he heard music and dancing and he called one of the servants and said, what's going on? He said, your brother is come home and the father hath killed the fatted calf because he'd received him safe and sound. And he was angry. He would not go in. Therefore came, out, came his father out and entreated him. And he swearing, he, he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve you, neither transgressed I at any time your commandment, and yet you never gave me a kid or a goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as your son was come, which hath devoured thy living, now notice, he didn't get the transfer. He didn't, he didn't understand what this boy had was, was his inheritance. The, the, the older son never made the transition in his mind. He always saw that as his daddy's money. He, he didn't understand ownership. But the young son understood ownership. And you notice it says, and he squandered all of his living. Not his daddy's, his. Yeah. My daddy told me when he was explaining the trust fund, he said, now, son, you can do whatever you want to with that trust fund. But he said, if you're smart, you will keep it in its original form, and it'll take care of you and your children and their children, etc. Don't get rid of it. Don't spend it. Don't cash it. Don't waste it. Right. And he learned this from a Jewish business friend of his. Uh, he said, that's how we Jews hold on to everything we have. He said the family jewels, the, the family china, the silver, all of the um, properties and everything that we own, all the money, the cash, everything stays in the trust fund. Therefore, if you have one child that's irresponsible, they can't destroy or waste or lose the whole thing. It's, they can borrow against it. <laughs> they can draw interest off of it, but they can't touch the principle of it. And he said that's the way we hold on to our money. And my dad bought into that, and he did the same thing. He said, if you're smart, you won't, you know, won't get rid of it or whatever. So that's what my sister and I have done. It just, you know, my grandfather Caldwell used to give us silver dollars every year for Christmas in our stocking. I still have mine. She still has hers. And those silver dollars, uh, I looked at one of them the other day. It was, it was minted in 1889. And if you look it up, that's the year my grandfather was born. If you look it up, they're still worth a lot of money. Yeah. You know, if we didn't have such high inflation, all that would be worth more. But it's, yeah. 
It's worth more than a dollar. But you hold on to it. Anything that's valuable, you don't sell it, cash it in. You know, you, you hold on to it because it will increase in value. My son and I traded cars just about two or three months ago. I had a car that I had bought. It was a 19, uh, uh, excuse me, a 2012 Ford Expedition. It was a used car. I saw it on a lot. It was a perfect condition, mint condition. Only had 70,000 miles on it. And uh, so I bought it, and I knew when I bought it that it wasn't mine. I knew I was buying it for him, so when he was in town, I gave it to him. I said, here, the Lord told me to give you this car. Oh, he was thrilled. Because I had given him years before a 2003 Escalade. And he said, well, what am I going to do with this Escalade? I said, well, give it back to me. I said, I'll drive it. I don't have anything else to drive, and uh, so I'll just, I'll just drive it. So I started repairing stuff. It had 215,000 miles on it. I thought, dear Lord, this thing's ready for the junk pile. <laughs> but <clears throat> I'll just keep it. And I told my son, I said, you can sell it if you want to or give it to me. I'll fix it up and whatever. So I've been driving it. Got all the little things that were wrong with it fixed up. So I was up at uh, Parker Cadillac the other day having some work done on it. And Dave Parker walked out and he said, what are you, happy, what are you going to do with that? Uh, escalate. I said, I'm going to drive it. He said, well, that's not good for the economy. <laughs> I said, I know you want me to trade it. He said, yeah, I want you to trade. I'll give you a good deal. You know, I said, Dave, that car's got 215,000 miles. I said, it's 20 years old. He said, that doesn't matter. He said, what do you think that car's worth? I said, I went online and looked at them. I said, they're, they're, they're selling anywhere from $5,000 to $10,000. 20 years old, 215,000 miles. He looked at me and he said, it's worth a lot more than that now. Well, I can get more for it now. I can get more for it now than I've got in it. I mean, I've been fixing it up just you know a little bit at a time. You'd be amazed at what things are worth these days. They're worth more today. You can sell your old dog of a car for a lot more than you can think. But the problem is, is when you try to replace it. <laughs> okay, let's move right along. Let's finish this up. He said, as soon as your son was come, which devoured thy living, he still hadn't taken ownership, with harlots, you killed for him, the fatted calf. Now listen to what the father said to the son. Son, verse 31, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. Hmm. All that I have is yours. Every bit of it is yours. Hmm. Glory. Notice, here are the bullet points. The young son said, give me what belongs to me, verse 12. It was his, verse 13. He took ownership of it. He said, make me a servant. He couldn't make him a servant because he was born a son. The older son had no understanding of ownership. The father said, all I have is yours. Now, you are an owner and a son by your faith in Jesus Christ. God's given you authority over all the work of His hands. The steward, on the other hand, is what you do with what you own. This is where people get confused. This helps you understand it and separate it. A steward properly manages the resources of what's been given to him. I know my dad used to give me things just to see how I would take care of them. He and I went together and bought my first car. It cost $250. And he watched how I took care of that car. That was a trial. That was a, a learning lesson. The unjust steward was a contrast to the son. 
final contrast between stewardship mentality and ownership mentality. You have to develop the ownership mentality, but you can't get lifted up in pride or in greed. You ever heard the statement, I think probably we heard it quoted from Winston Churchill or somebody like that, but it actually goes back to a fellow by the name of Lord Beckton. And he made the statement <clears throat> that um, if you are given uh, authority, it corrupts you. Absolute authority corrupts absolutely. If you ever studied the history of World War II and General Day, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, when he became the Allied Supreme Commander. Now, he was the commander, but he had all the other heads of all the other armed services of all the nations that were in the war that were under him. But he told Winston Churchill that he would not take that position as Supreme Allied Commander unless he had the final say. Now, Lord Becton is the one that made the statement, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Because if you have no moral compass, then that absolute power feeds the pride of the fallen man. And that's what's happened when you have absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I've done a study on pride, and I tell you what, pride is everywhere. I, I'm talking about in, in us. I've been looking at it in my life, and it's amazing the little things that you don't even think about. When pride gets in there, you need to learn to identify it and nail it. Amen. And repent of it and ask God to deliver you from it. But absolute power, absolute authority corrupts absolutely. But Eisenhower had to have that absolute power to be the supreme allied commander. But he wanted to hear from all of the other uh, commanders because he was fair and uh, he recognized their power and authority. Okay, uh, let's begin to close this. Um, I had a, a lady send this to me and I wrote it down and I want to read it to this congregation. Ownership is really self-serving unless you realize the purpose and the impact of it. We're to take ownership of our assignment from God. What God has called each one of us to do, you have to take ownership of that. When we built our church, and then we started building the Family Life Center, I got this letter from a lady in our church. Quote, I want to be a part of this church family by being involved in building the Family Life Center. I was not here when the other buildings were built. But now, since the building campaign has been turned over to us, I am able to take ownership. Isn't that good? Because too many times in churches, other organizations, we look to the leader or the visionary. We look to them to do it all. We look to them to build the building. We look to them to raise the money. Uh, it wasn't too long into the pastorate where um, the uh, church board required me to have to, to take a physical and, and uh, to <clears throat> they would uh, get a, a life insurance policy for me. In case I died <laughs> during the building project, uh, they'd collect the life insurance and it helped pay the bills because you're the chief fundraiser. Yeah. Well, that, that not ought, ought not to be. So when we built the Family Life Center, we reversed that and we turned the responsibility over to the congregation. Right. Amen. Everybody had a responsibility. Everybody had a part. Everybody had to take ownership. But that's what blessed me so is that this lady, she said, I was not here when you built the original building. 
but I want to be a part of this family. So I, when you turn the building over to us, I made a decision to take ownership. That is so powerful. So whatever the Lord reveals to faith builders to do, every one of you have to take ownership of the vision. You can't leave it to pastors Philip and Michelle Steele. You have to take ownership of it. <laughs> Instead of what happens in so many churches, you know, everybody's not at church every Sunday, so a visitor might come in and, you know, sit somewhere and somebody's always coming up to him and say, you're sitting in my seat. Uh, but the reverse of that is, oh, we're so glad you came. This is my seat, but I'm so glad you, you can have my seat. This is my seat. And, you know, a lot of churches, denominational churches, when they were building things, they'd always have, you know, uh, pay for a pew. Mm -hmm. Everybody buy a pew. Mm -hmm. That's taking ownership. We take ownership of the vision. It's not just their job to pray. It's just not their job to pay. It's everybody's job. It's our assignment is to take ownership of it. Right. We're not renters. We're not... We're not uh, servants, we are being good stewards of what we've been given. First, we must be faithful in what belongs to God. That's the tithe. We have to give the tithe to the Lord. Um, we're not servants, but we're sons. We're sons by nature. The son that we read about in Luke 15... Uh, the, the older son. He never had an ownership mentality before. The father ignored the young son's ignorance when he told him, just make me a servant. The older son never had son mentality. Well, according to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 6, we now have joint ownership privilege with God through Christ. I remember something John Avanzini said one time. He was preaching at our church, and he said he'd been in New York City, and he went out to get a cab, and uh, he said the cabs were lined up, and he said there was a guy in front of him. said uh, John had hustled a cab, and a cab drove up, and this guy just broke right in front of him. I mean, in New York City, you can get yourself killed doing this. And he broke in front of him and, and got his cab. And uh, the guy next to him said, why did you allow that? He said, oh, man, he said, he works for me. He said, what do you mean he works for you? He had an alligator briefcase and snapping shoes, and he jumped in there and got John's cab. He, he told the guy next to him, he said, he works for me. He said, what do you mean he works for me? He said, the Bible says the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. He works for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, have you ever been to New York City on the street corners? They're selling um, Louis Vuitton purses, and you can buy them for a hundred bucks. They look just like the real thing, but they're not the real thing. And you better buy yours quick because as soon as a lot of people gather around, then the police come up and arrest the guy <laughs> for selling knockoffs at a hundred bucks a piece. Uh, there's always imitators and um, so forth. Okay. We now have joint ownership privilege with God. Now, we can usually respond to God two ways, pressure or by the Holy Spirit. God's way is not pressure. His way is the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm going to stop right there. I think we've... Uh, ah, I'm right on time, Jean. She told me, she said, now don't go over an hour. You're, you're supposed to stop at 7 o'clock. Okay. <laughs> Wives are good at that. Remember when Jerry Savelle used to come and do our camp meetings every once in a while? And we were down at the uh, Teamsters Union Hall. We used to have some of them down there because we didn't have an auditorium big enough. And Carolyn would sit on the, the front row. 
And she had purchased a pair of glasses that were battery operated and they had lights on the lens and you just push a button and they'd start flashing. And she wore those because when Jerry's time was up, she'd push it and the glasses would go like this. And he knew that was time to stop. Well, this particular night, they had some kind of electrical power problem. And right in the middle of his message, the whole union hall went dark. All the lights went out. And Jerry said, Carolyn, you've gone too far now. (laughs) But we need somebody to help us, don't we? Okay. Um, As I close, claiming our rights as believers, there's the legal side of redemption and the vital side of redemption. The legal side is the grace side. It's what God has already done. God's already done the plan of salvation. God's already healed you, delivered you, prospered you. But your faith is how you access the grace, what God has already done for you. And, and he's, he's done it for you because you're His son, you're His daughter, your family. And then your vital side is the working out. It's the stewardship. It's the performing. It's the, the confession. God gave man... Uh, dominion over the works of his hands. But it's your responsibility to find that out, to know that, and uh, fulfill your assignment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did y'all get anything out of this tonight? Yes, Will you get all three lessons in a, and listen to them? And uh, I, I think it will really, really help you. Uh, I got time for this one more short story, I think just to illustrate some of this stuff. And you may have heard Brother uh, Jesse or Jerry tell it. When they started doing meetings together several years ago, uh, they were scheduled to be in New York City at a big auditorium to hold a crusade. And their staffs would go with them and their trucks would go with them and they set up the sound system, the book tables and all that. And so they were working real hard. They were behind. Only had an hour before the meeting started and... and, uh, when they got ready to set everything up, the union boss came out uh, over the uh, auditorium, the, the uh, center that they had rented, and said, what do you think you're doing? And they said, uh, we're, we're setting up our equipment. We've got a meeting. He said, no, you don't set up anything here. The union does all that. And he said, and if the union doesn't do it, you don't have it done. It's got to be done by the union. So well, we've got an hour. We've got to be ready. He said, I don't care how much time you got. He said, we're the union. You understand? And either we set it up or it don't get set up. Well, Jerry was all upset, didn't know what to do. And Jesse said, you know, you remember him telling the story about how he got a mob boss's son saved and delivered off of drugs? And that mob boss came to his house, introduced himself, said, I just want to thank you for what you did for my grandson. He said, well, I didn't do anything. He said, it was Jesus. He said, whatever. <laughs> he said, here's my number. I can do things you can't do. You ever need any help? Just call that number. So Jesse said, he asked Kathy, he said, Kathy, where is that number? <laughs> she said, Jesse, don't you dare. He said, give me that number. So he called that number. And he told the guy, he said, uh, we're in New York. And he said, they won't let us set up our stuff on the stage. They say the union's got to do it. Can you help me? He said, call me back in five minutes. He said, all of a sudden, that union boss came up to him. He was so nice. He said, Mr. Duplantis, he said, "Uh, why didn't you tell me uh, who you knew and whatever, whatever. And they set that thing up in record time. It didn't cost Jesse anything. Didn't you know they, they had it done? Because he took ownership of the situation. Make you an offer, you can't refuse. And I, I read the history of a, a mob boss. I think you can still buy the book. It's called "Let Me Make You an Offer You Can't Refuse." And he tells about how the mob operates and how 
it, it's still, <laughs> the mob is alive and well in, uh, in this country. People don't believe it, but it is. And, and they take ownership of the situation. Now, they don't have the authority to do it, but they do it. They take ownership. And then Jesse just, you know, took ownership. And uh, <laughs> these guys were afraid that they're going to wake up with broke legs or kneecaps <laughs> busted, you know, something like that. There's, there's a force to be reckoned with. And, uh, and, and that's all right sometimes. Not, and I'm not talking about breaking <laughs> kneecaps. I, I'm talking about taking uh, y- your ownership privilege, taking authority. We were in an airport down in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana one time, and we had been given an airplane, and it was in the hangar. We were getting ready to come home. And uh, they had gone to get the plane out of the hangar and bring it around. While we're standing there, me and Jeannie and Ronnie, there were these four businessmen standing there, uh, just, you know, a hand away, and just cussing up a storm. I mean, using every word you can ever imagine. And we were just really getting... Uh, nerved by it, especially uh, Jeannie and I, I I just really had had enough and so I just thought okay here goes I walked right up in the middle of these guys and of course these are all you know suits men businessmen briefcase snapping alligator shoes and all that kind of stuff and I just walked right up in the middle and this one guy said uh, can I help you I said yeah I said, my wife and son and I are sitting over here and we're tired of listening to your, uh, your cursing and your trashy mouth and taking our Lord's name in vain. So just shut your mouth or go out into the hangar. <laughs> Boy, they looked at me like, and I didn't know what they were going to do. You know, if they went like this, I was going to, you know... <laughs> And I want you to know they looked at me and they said, we're very sorry. Please accept our apology. And they went out into the hangar. Sometimes you have to take ownership of the situation. I better quit. (laughs) Thank you all for letting me minister to you on these three uh, Sunday nights. If the pastor invites me back, we'll get a new topic.